Good morning, Foothill Church. Um, I'm Diane Carrasco. I'm a covenant partner here, and I serve um, in guest services at the Info area and growth groups. Um, our scripture today is going to be found in 1 Timothy 4, 7, and 8, and Romans 12, 1 to 2. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Romans 12, 1, 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You may be seated. Thank you. So by now, if you've been coming, you know we're in this series uh, called Practicing the Christian Life, where we, we want to look at these disciplines that will help us to grow, to be trained uh, in godliness, to look more like Jesus, right? Now, I want to I give you a couple of theological categories uh, just to kind of help you ex explain maybe a little uh, further what we're doing here. So when it comes to our salvation, okay, we believe, we believe this is what the Bible teaches, that, that the, the, the one who does the saving is, is God, right? It, it, like, to you belongs that, that. I mean, it, God is the God of salvation and Him alone. And there's a theological term for that. We call it monergism. That is like meaning one energy, one worker. And that is God is the worker that brought you to Himself, okay? But... When it comes to our sanctification, we believe in something called synergism. That is that we cooperate with God when it comes to, with the Spirit in our lives, when it comes to our Christian growth and our sanctification. We have a part to play, in other words. So we walk through and this whole, this whole training in godliness, practicing the Christian life is about the fact that we actually train. We, we get involved, right? The Spirit of God prompts us, shows us this is what we do, and we cooperate him, the, the, with Him. The Bible is going to say we can grieve the Holy Spirit, right? We can, we can submit to the Holy Spirit. And so, so we want to do that in our sanctification and our growth. And today we get to the subject of learning for the sake of godliness. And, and so let's just real quickly, learning, I want to approach this from an angle of not just, hey, here's ways you can learn. I want to approach this from, from the, the, the angle of your mind because, because learning is what? Learning is just it's the way we learn to think. It's, it, it's, it's helping us with our thinking. If I'm learning math, it's helping numbers not to just be random. If I'm learning how to read, it's helping shape that. So I see these letters and they're clumped together and I'm shaping my mind. I'm learning how to think. That's, that's what learning is. It is the discipline of our, of, of our thinking. It's training my mind in the way of thinking. So this is why... I wanted to remind us of our, where, where we are in terms of you know, every week, our anchor passage, 1 Timothy 4, right? Train yourself in godliness. But then I wanted you to see Romans 12, especially verse 2. And you ought to open your Bibles there. I hope you will. Because Paul's going to say, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay? That's the phrase in verse 2 that I really want to focus in on this morning. Right? Don't be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So let's talk about our minds. Um, I don't think it surprises anybody to find out that we are in the midst of maybe one of the greatest mental health crises uh, that certainly our generation will, will ever know. It's, uh, th there are reports now that something like 38% of, of Gen Z, 18 to 25, uh, actually have reported diagnosed mental illness. Okay, now, mental illness isn't new. It's been around since the dawn of time, right? But, but the proliferation, right, the ubiquity of mental illness is new. And, and, uh, and experts are saying that that didn't just happen. Okay, in other words, 
I think every older generation looks down on younger generations and go, you weak, wimpy, whatever, right? That, that happens in every generation, right? It didn't happen simply because there's a weaker group of 18 to 25-year-olds. There were cultural forces, are cultural forces that coalesce, that, that came together, that are causing, and that's what most people are looking at and saying, man, this is, this is a caused phenomenon. It didn't just emerge out of nowhere. And so what are those forces? What are the rivers that run together to cause the kind of mental health crisis we're seeing today? Well, there's several, but let me give you a, a few of them. Uh, number one is simply the increasing secularization of our world, certainly of the West and certainly America, right? And it, here, here's what the research says. The more secular and progressive a person is, the more neurotic. I'm not using that as a put-down term. That's exactly what it says. The more neurotic, the more, the more progressive a person, the more secular a person, the higher degree of anxiety and depression, feelings of loneliness, despondency, despair, a misunderstanding, lots of things we could say about that. that. That's just what it says, right? Now, this should make sense to us in this sense, if we're Christians, that, that that's because we are people who must have meaning in our lives. Like people need meaning. We need truth. We need a bedrock to build our lives on. And if the only meaning of life is to maximize pleasure and minimize pain, that's not enough to sustain our mental health. Do you know this? We cannot sustain the kind of mental health that we need by just saying, man, all I got to do with my life is maximize my pleasure and minimize my pain. So, so what's happening is we're seeing this secularism. It's not, the, the, that can't feed your soul. The, the, the second sort of cultural force is, of course, and it's been around a long time, is the breakdown of the family, right? So we have, lots of you are, are, uh, are children of divorced parents. Uh, you come from broken homes. You, we now live, a younger generation, now there's this whole hookup culture, right? Where, where you know, intimacy doesn't mean anything. It's really just, just two people together and we, it's lost its meaning. We have the legalization of drugs. You have all these kind of things that are going on that are this poisonous soup, if you will, that, that drills down to almost the identity of who a person is to the point that we even say that even your gender is open for debate, it's what you're, you know, assigned at birth. Never mind that every, every part of your DNA, if they took a test on you, would say, I'm a woman or I'm a man. And there's no way around that, but it's now fluid. So no wonder there's this, I don't even know who I am anymore. That's the second thing. But the third thing, you might have guessed, is uh, technology. The sort of third river coming into all this is technology. And I, I, I found this incredibly fascinating. I heard this this week, and I want to share this with you. Uh, a woman by the name of Jean Twenge, uh, she's not a believer. She's a psychologist. She studies the relationships, sort of the, the, the differences and similarities between generations. She doesn't come at it from, she's a social psychologist, she doesn't come at it from the angle of one generation's better than the other, I'm, you know, I'm boomer and I'm saying bad, it's not that at all. She's saying, let's, let's look at the different markers and things that are just sort of trying to objectively evaluate what's the difference between generations. So she, she writes this back in 2017, she writes an article, and here's what it's called, you can look it up sometime, it says, have smartphones destroyed a generation? Okay, now, now listen to this. She says this, around 2012, I noticed an abrupt shift in teen behaviors and emotional states. The gentle slopes of the line graphs, so they were just sort of going up nice and even, suddenly became steep mountains and sheer cliffs, and many of the distinctive characteristics of the millennial generation began to disappear. In all my analyses of generational data, some reaching back to the 1930s, I had never seen anything like it. So just stop for a minute, and here's what she's saying. Something happened in 2012. Something happened that caused it to go from just a slope to these, these radical, just huge increases and, 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 and spikes and all this. What happened in 2012? She says this. It was exactly the moment when the proportion of Americans who own smartphones surpassed 50%. And it was exactly that moment that we saw this sort of these factors that created these, these markers of mental health or mental illness 
uh, skyrocketed. I, I don't think this is a coincidence. Like something went on in our brains, in our minds, and now we're seeing way more loneliness, an exponential increase in depression, anxiety, all these things since 2012. It had never looked like that before. Those things were around, they just weren't around to the extent they are now. So here we are. And by the way, the church isn't immune. Why? Because we swim in the same culture, right? You go out into this increasingly secular world, this increasingly progressive world, and there's something that's wanting to shape you into, into that mold, right? You, many of you come from broken homes. Think of these three rivers, right? The, the culture. Well, we're all in it, right? We're all there. We're, 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 some of us are from broken homes. Some of you, right, you, you, your, your, your mom and dad were divorced or, or you've been part of the hookup culture maybe at one point. You see all these kind of things. Or, uh, you, you, and, and, and I would guess, what, 98% of you or 99% of you statistically have a smartphone in your pocket. You maybe even have it in your hand right now. You're looking at a Bible on it. That's fine, right? I hope you should use it for that. That's fine. Uh, and, and a huge number of you have social media, huge numbers, right? So all these things, we're not immune. We're swimming in sort of the same cesspool as everybody else. So what are we supposed to do? What do we do about this? That's why I wanted us to look at Romans and some other verses this morning. Okay, we're trying to train so if this is going on and our minds and what we're thinking about is rewiring our brains, I think we can say that, then what are we supposed to do? Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So, so hear me, Paul's going to do this. He's going to say there's a negative part to this and there's a positive part to this. The negative is don't be conformed. The positive is be transformed, right? So you see this? So, so if we were to use sports terminology, that, that it, what, what, what we must do is play offense and defense when it comes to our minds. We must guard against certain things. We must pursue other things. So, so Paul looks and says, how do I encourage Christians? How do I help them? This is a big issue for them to not be conformed, but to be transformed. And his answer is by the renewal of your mind. You, you've got to have a renewed mind. Now, okay, don't be conformed, be transformed. We, we are imitative creatures. We just are, right? Every person in here, in fact, it makes life easier. We look for patterns, right? We, we look, for, we, 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 we look for, for, for people to imitate, somebody in my career, you know, somebody who's a father, a mother. I'm look, you're const we're constantly looking around to not have to reinvent the wheel in all areas of life. Has somebody done this before in a way? And I'm trying to, I'm tr I want to, I want to try to imitate my life around them. Now, listen, when it comes to our spiritual lives, there's, there's two baskets that an imitation can fall into. There's two patterns that we can be conformed to, the pattern of the world or the pattern of Christ. There's really only those two choices, and those are two value systems. Those are two worldviews. Those are two standards that are utterly incompatible. John Stott comments on this passage, and he says this, whether we are thinking about the purpose of life or the meaning of life, about how to measure greatness or how to respond to evil, about ambition, sex, honesty, money, community, religion, or anything else, the two, the two sets of standards diverge so completely that there is no possibility of compromise. That's what we got. And it all starts with the mind. Now, do you realize, do you realize that you can choose what you think about? I think, I think you know this. Like, you, you understand, human beings are the only species, if I can say it this way, that can consider and meditate and mull things over in their mind, right? Can sort of choose the path that their mind takes. So, I mean, look, there's not conventions of armadillos trying to solve the world health crisis, right? There's not packs of elephants that are wondering, how can I get my kids into college? Like, this isn't happening in the animal kingdom is my point, right? We think like this. We consider 
we meditate, we think, we mull all the time. I get to choose. So it's no wonder, if that's true about us, it's no wonder that your Bible is so concerned with the life of your mind. Now, before you think that what I'm talking about this morning, when I talk about the life of the mind, uh, is intellectualism or academia, okay, let me put that not at all. I'm not, I'm not talking about, are you a genius? Are you super intelligent? Did you do well in school? When I talk about the life of the mind, I'm saying, this is just everybody in this room. All of you think, <laughs> everybody, you can't help it. Like your, your, your mind right now, you know, some of you are thinking about lunch, right? Some of you are, some of you, your mind has wandered to all kinds of different places. You are constantly thinking. You can't not think. In fact, if I told you, I don't want you to picture Ike you know, in a sombrero, you're like, well, too late, right? Because now you've done it to me. And so I've got this picture in my mind, right? I'm constantly, I can't not think. So, so, okay. So, so what do I do? If everybody thinks, if, if we're, if we're giving attention to stuff all the time, if we can't help it, then then again, we shouldn't be surprised to find out that the Bible has a lot to say about the life of your mind and what you must do with your mind. What you have to do with your mind. In fact, let me just say this. I, these next two weeks really are, are kind of, okay, we've got all these spiritual disciplines and I want to now take these spiritual disciplines and go, all right, um, they kind of wrap up in this. This applies to every single one of these. I'll show you that in a moment. But, but these, are, these are ways of training our minds. But let me, let me show you. Let me, the Bible has much to say about this. Okay, so, so look at this. Look at Matthew chapter 22. Jesus says, the great commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. Romans 8, I love this. Like those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. For the mind that is set on the flesh is death, but the mind that is set on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Then it's going to go on. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Philippians chapter 4, some of you know this verse. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Colossians chapter 4, we're going to start Colossians in a few weeks. few weeks, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. You see this over and over and over again. You can choose what you think about. You can cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Um, We are commanded to to play offense and defense when it comes to our minds, to be disciplined, right? To say say yes to the things of God. In fact, we, we must. But our problem, I would say most of us, your pastor included, like, like, most of our problems is that when it comes to our mind, we're lazy. We are passive. We are undisciplined. We don't do what Paul said he did, and that is to take every thought captive. We let our minds wander, right? We, we set our minds on things that are very, very unhelpful. And there's so many cultural forces at play that are causing your mind and, and assisting your mind and pushing your mind away from the things of God and toward things that are hurtful and harmful. So, okay, so, so we have to be, Paul's gonna say, basically we've got to, we've got to resist, we've gotta not do this and, and do other things. So, so my mind, I've gotta do some things with my mind. And, and maybe one of the reasons that we're suffering from so much mental illness is because we have completely undisciplined minds. We don't combat things with the truth. We just let our minds go where they're going to go. 
you will become like what you think. Do you know this? Your, your thinking will determine the trajectory of your life, of your spiritual growth, of your, of your mental health. <laughs> um, all, all, all this is true. Now, look, I'm not, hear me. Please don't say, oh, Chris doesn't think there's anything such as mental disease. Yes, of course there is. I'm saying I wonder, I wonder how much of the proliferation of this is simply because we have decided we're not going to be disciplined. Your mind will determine the trajectory of your life. What you think about will either transform you or conform you. L- look at this. Look at, look at, listen to what Paul says. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Okay, he's talking about when we become Christians, and he's going to go back and use the example of Moses going in, and, and he would go in, and he'd, his face would be unveiled. He would, he would uh, talk to the Lord as a man talks to a friend, and when he came out, his face was shining. So he put the veil back on. Okay, and the people would see Moses with a veiled face. Well, Paul says, he says in verse, uh, chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Verse uh, 15, just you can go there. He says, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. Talking about the Jews. Okay, they don't, they don't see. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. It's as though you're going into the Holy of Holies. The veil is removed now. And he says, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, same word as chapter of, of Romans 12 too, into the same image from one degree of, of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Now hear what he said. Do, 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 do you get the logic of verse 18 if you're looking at it? We, with unveiled face, I go in, beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed. We will become, our friend Jared Wilson says, like what we behold. Like what we set our minds on. Like what we focus on. Like what we look at. And this is why I can say, like he said, like, look, like, think of Moses. Went in, God, he's there face to face. And he comes out and he's like, his face is different. His whole countenance has changed. We become like what we look at. You know, by the way, um, have you ever heard that, that um, the longer a couple is married, the more they look alike? Have you ever heard this? It's actually, this is actually a, a, a fact that I know that sounds you're like, oh my gosh, please, right? I mean, um, my poor wife, right? Uh, but but um, I think that, so that, that they'd say the reason for that, by the way, is that is that we tend, to, we're imitative again, right? So we tend to look at people and if they do something, you know, sort of like interesting with their mouth or whatever, we, we tend to copy it and it starts to shape the muscles in our face and then we, we start to look like them, right? So over time, we sort of ca- take on some of the same facial features. Well, I think, I think that's a really interesting thing to think about. We, with unveiled face, we behold the face of Jesus in the scriptures. We, we behold him as we listen to the preach word of God. And the more we do this, the more we're exposed to this, the more we become like him. So you understand the discipline of your mind. Uh, again, this is not some intellectual exercise. This is the difference between you being transformed or being conformed. This is the difference between a trajectory of spiritual growth or one where you stagnate and say, man, I'm not going anywhere. It is the discipline, the failure to take our thoughts captive, to cultivate the life of the mind, to eliminate some things. Okay, let me give you an analogy. Your mind mind is like a garden, okay, at our house, we're really good at killing things in gardens, right? But I think I know the basic principle of gardening, right? The basic principle is this. You, you have to plant good things and you have to eliminate bad things. Is that fair, right? So I've got I've to put in the vegetables that I'm hoping to get, right? I, 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 I can't plant a rose bush and hope for tomatoes. I got to put in the tomatoes or put in the rose bush if that's what I want, right? But it's got to go in and then I've got to eliminate all of the, the noxious weeds and the, the stuff, the bad insects, that kind of thing. So there's this, there's this elimination part to gardening and there's this cultivation part of, of, of gardening. And, and it's not either or, it's both and. I can't just eliminate things or I've just got a plot of dirt. I can't just cultivate or it's the weeds are going to take over and they won't grow. There's an offense and defense. You see what I'm talking about? This is, this is our minds. We are, we are 
called to resist some things and to pursue other things. In fact, I, I think this is interesting if you look at it through this lens. Listen to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, James is going to end or get to the, about the middle of the chapter in, in verse 13, and he says this, let, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted for God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Okay, so I feel tempted, James, so where does this come from? How did it get there? So James says, but each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. And the desire when it's conceived gives birth to sin and sin when it's fully grown brings forth death. Where did it all start? So I, I think we can look at that and say, it, where do all those things happen? They happen in your mind. It's an undisciplined mind. It's a place that says, man, the, the, the weeds can grow. This is where that it germinated there. The desire came and then it conceived and then it gave birth to death. And it all started with your mind. So, so what do we do? Well, I think this is what Paul's saying. We renew our mind um, through elimination and renew our mind through cultivation to think of that gardening image. Okay, we renew it through elimination. In other words, here, here, here's what I want to look at. How do we resist being conformed to the pattern of the world? Like Paul says, don't do this. Okay, don't do that, do this. How do we resist it? How do I not become conformed to the pattern of this world? Let me give you two things under this heading. Number one, we fight passivity. And I might add actively, right? We fight passivity. See, look, look what Paul does here. Look at R Romans 12. He says, don't be conformed. Any English majors in the room? Okay. I'm the only one? Okay, well, <laughs> hey, yeah, right, right. We've got, we got like five of you in here. Be conformed. This is just grammar. This is an English major stuff. Be conformed is, this is a test, ready? What kind of verb? Somebody said it. Yes, passive. It's a passive verb. Okay, in other words, if you do nothing, if you do nothing, you will be conformed. There's a mold. It's the shape of the world. It's pressing down on you. And if you do nothing and you're merely passive, you will be shaped into the pattern of the world. And so what do we do? We've got to resist it. See, how many of you, like you would look at your life and go, man, I am struggling with lust and depression and anxiety and loneliness and all these different things. And yet, if you were to be honest with yourself, you'd say, I am utterly passive when it comes to my mind. I sort of let these things take hold and they just run. Like they, just, they, just, they, they, they take me with it. What's happening? The world is pressing you, pressing you, pressing you. And man, it wants to do everything in its power to punch this mold down across your life. And, 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 and you do you don't resist what I'm saying. You've got to resist it. And, and by the way, right, that's not our own strength, right? If, if, if we are followers of Jesus, we have the spirit of Christ living in us, dwelling in us, helping us, empowering us to resist the pattern making of this world. So we resist it. We fight it. Some of you have just flat out got to start fighting for your mind to not be conformed. The second thing is, is that we guard the gate to our mind. And here's where I have to meddle. <laughs> okay. Um, look, we have to look at our, 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 our mind and go, I have, I've got to stand guard in front of what I allow in. Because most of us allow lots and lots and lots of garbage into our minds. Right? Remember, you've heard the saying, garbage in, garbage out. Why, why are we insane enough to believe that I can, you know, if my life is a bucket and I got two faucets here and one is just raw sewage and I fill that bucket up with raw sewage, it would be insanity for me to believe that when I pour that thing out, it would be clean, pure, drinkable water. Right? Is that unreasonable for me to say? That's crazy. Most of us think like this. We think, contrary to Scripture, that we can pour junk 
and garbage and sewage into our minds and believe we're okay. I mean, j- j- look, how, do, how, do we, how does garbage get into your life? How does sewage get into your mind? Well, I think if I just said, you got, here's the test, go, 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 tell, me, tell me what it, you could tell me. It's through your ears, it's through your eyes, right? It's through those senses that we allow things in. Jesus, remember, Jesus says the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the, the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? He's going to warn against not listening to false teachers, right? There's things that come for the ear gate, the eye gate. The fact is you have a gate and you've got to guard it. And yet what do we think? We think we'll be okay. Look, um, I remember, I, I don't believe there's any good old days. So hear me when I say this. I'm, you know, you're like, I'm going to start talking. You're like, okay, boomer. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not a boomer. So th- th- there's that. But, but uh, I, I do remember like, you know, I, TV, right? We, we all watch TV and, and, and love it. And uh, I remember though, we all, most of us can remember the days when if you wanted to watch the show you love, right? Seinfeld's 8 o'clock on Thursday night. Anybody remember those days? And so you'd watch it and then you'd wait a week and you got to watch another episode. You'd wait another week and watch another episode, right? And this was before VCRs and you couldn't really, you know, like you're just like, I've got to be there. So you had this sort of week of rest and laughter or whatever. Well, I can watch nine seasons of, 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 of Seinfeld now um, in a weekend. Just one after another, after another, after another, after another, right? We do this... <laughs> Don't lie, you do this. We all do this all the time. Now, how is it, how is it that we, that, that we think with that constant stream, I'm not talking about you watch a half an hour show once a week, that constant stream through your TV, through your iPhone, right? You can now take, when it, it's not convenient for you to sit in front of a TV, well, that's okay. I can take it into the bathroom if I want and watch it there. There's no break. I can go anywhere I want and have this media coming into my eyes, into my ears constantly. And that's true for some of you. Some of you, have a constant soundtrack in the back of your life. How is it that we think we can fill our minds and eyes and ears with vitriol and anger and violence and pornography uh, and lust? I, I could just go on and on, right? And we can do this for hours and hours, and most of us will say something like this, it doesn't affect me. Then you don't believe your Bible. You don't believe your Bible. Because, men, you are flooding your mind with garbage. See, see some of you, some of you have this constant, pick your, like, MSNBC, Fox News, Twitter, like just flowing into your mind practically all day long. And then you're surprised that you're angry, that you're edgy. Some of you in the name of art, it's a good story. That's a good one, huh? It's a good story. Lots of sex scenes, but you know, you're like the guy in the 1970s who said he read Playboy for the articles. It doesn't affect me. And then you wonder why you struggle with lust. Like some of you have a music stream constantly. And you know, I mean, and, and you like maybe emo or, you know, kind of like really sad, like really, because it's, it's, it's deep, right? It's deep because it's depressing. And, and, and then you wonder why you're sad and depressed and anxious. You see what I mean? Some of you do all these things. <laughs> You're like, man, I can't get a hold of my emotions at all. Not realizing all this media, all this stuff that floods into your mind nearly constantly is like a Trojan horse. And then we're stunned that the enemy's inside the camp. How did they, could they possibly get here? See, we have to stop. 
Like some of you need to do some sort of digital detox. Now, look, if, if you think, man, it seems like Pastor Chris is on a campaign to get everybody off of social media, you wouldn't be wrong. Um, uh, um, I think, so a little side here, I think we are on the tip of an iceberg in an experiment that we have no idea what it's going to do to people's minds. I was talking to somebody after first service. Oh, no, I'm not going to say anything. No, I'm not, no, I, 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 I don't. God, maybe some of you do this and I don't want to say this. So I, 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 think, I think, listen, moms and dads, moms and dads, I beg you. I beg you. Be so careful about how many smart devices you stick in front of your children. Michelle and I were, I'll just tell you personally, we were on the, you know, it was, it was a brand new experiment when some of our kids were 12, 13, 14 years old, and we thought, oh, this whole iPad thing, this is cool, and we gave them one. Both she and I would say today, I would never do that, ever again. If I could rewind the clock, forget it. I'm not angry at technology. Here's my point. We don't guard the gate. We just don't guard the gate. We just allow these things to flood. Some of you just need to flat out. Listen, let me, can I just be super practical with you? A lot of you need to open up your phones at home, please, and, and delete lots of apps. Just a lot of them. News feeds constantly bombarding you with, I'm guessing, not good news. But how will I keep up with the world? Seriously? How can you not? Some of you need to delete your social media. See, man, I, I, I want to be this practical with you because here's the deal. If following Jesus stays up here in kind of this theoretical category and never works down, To, to like this afternoon and tomorrow morning and tomorrow night in where you actually live, what good is it? That's what we mean by practicing the Christian life. I hope you're seeing this, right? This is, this is like, this is, this is where you live and where I live. We have, we have got to guard the gate. That's that's playing defense. That's saying, I will not be conformed. And all of these things, all of these algorithms, everything that's pumping into our brain nearly constantly, all day long, I can promise you are not conforming you, transforming you into the image of Jesus. They're conforming you. So that's the defense. What about offense? How about renewing the mind through cultivation, right? So I've got to eliminate certain things from the garden. I've got to cultivate, right? I can't just pull out the weeds and have an empty garden. Because by the way, that works with gardens. It doesn't work with minds. You can't just eliminate. You must cultivate. Because again, you can't not think. You can't not ponder. You, 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 your mind has to go somewhere. So you've got to give it somewhere to go. So how do you do that? Well, let me give you three things. Pretty simple. Number one, practice the spiritual disciplines. This is exactly what this is about. Why do we read our Bible? Why do we meditate? Why should you journal? Why should you memorize Scripture? Because every single one of those things is helping renew your mind. I, I hope, you, by the way, I hope you don't hear me saying, Let's all leave here and be Amish and, and you can never watch a TV program again. I don't mean that. I genuinely don't mean that. I just mean we're terrible about curating our spiritual lives, about curating the feed that comes into us and undiscerning. We practice the spiritual disciplines. I mean, solitude, silence that Lucas talked about a few weeks ago. What, what's happening there? It's just like, man, I, hey, it's good. this is part of the detox even. It's good for me to just not have anything buzzing in my ears. I, I need to correct that. It's all about the renewal of your mind. Number two, we pursue biblical community. Now, let me explain why I'm saying this. 
Because when I say biblical community, let me, let me fill that skin with meaning. I mean this. I mean you are intentional about surrounding yourselves with people who love Jesus more than they love you. Like people who are going, the only way, in fact, I can love you well is by loving Jesus more than you. I can't be the loyal friend. I can't be the loving friend unless first I love Jesus more than I love you. And then I hope that what comes out of that is that you're able to be around people. Listen, every Christian, there ought to be moments where you're with your Christian friends and I hope you laugh your, 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 your heads off and you have a great time and all that. But I hope there's occasions and I hope they happen fairly often when the conversation turns and it's soul feeding conversation. It's biblically informed. And you walk away going, man, I felt so edified by that. I, 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 they helped me see things differently. It was ironing, sharpening iron there for a moment. And we were able, I was able to come out with, it, with my mind in some ways being renewed just by biblical community. Just by coming, listen, sitting where you're sitting right now. This is part of what you're doing. There is a discipline to this right here, that weekly rhythm of saying every single week I need to sit under the preached word of God to renew my mind or I'm going to be conformed. You are not going to hear any voice out there. I'm not trying to pitch you against the culture. I'm just saying this is just not going to happen. Nobody's going to say these things to you. I'm not saying that's because I'm clever. I'm saying this is the word of God. And this is what the Word of God does for you. This is why we have to be here to submit to this. We have to have our minds transformed. But lastly, we practice, let's call it digital discipleship. Okay, in other words, let me, let me give you a question to ask. Look, I want you to think of your digital feed. Okay, I want you to think of the, the things you most often go to. Those podcasts you listen to all the time. The streams that you, you know, you're watching all the time. Um, the, the, the radio that you're listening to or whatever, your, 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 your music that you're listening to. And I want you to just ask this question of it. Do, do your digital habits, okay, because these are habits, help you obey Romans 8? Okay, remember, set your mind on things above. Set your mind, like the mind that is set on the flesh is death. The mind that is set on the spirit is life and peace. Are you setting your mind on things above? Are you, is, it, is, it, is this renewing my mind or conforming me to something else? Like, look, I think these are really important. And if they're not, then just replace them. And by the way, there are literally hundreds of podcasts and YouTube channels and good places you can go. And, and listen, it, it, l lest you think I'm saying it can only be if it's, you know, somebody's up there preaching or talking theology. But no, there's really good stuff on, on just the world that we live in and culture and just helpful, you know, helping you learn or grow or whatever. Like, and, hey, here's a radical idea. You could completely put your phone away and walk outside. And turn around and look north and go, oh my gosh, look at those. Look at those mountains. And I get to live here. Look what God created. Right? There's something, a good discipline even about that. See, look, um, let, me, let me make something clear. Uh, I think whenever somebody stands up here, you think, that thing they're talking about, they've nailed it. I have not nailed this. Not even close. I think sometimes my mind is way too undisciplined. Way too undisciplined. This morning, I sat on the couch by myself. Solitude and, and, and silence are not my problem. <laughs> they're just not. My problem is where my mind goes. And so I sit there. And I'm getting ready to come and preach to you guys. And my mind starts into its own little doom loop. My own little sort of condemnation and like, oh no, and you know, things I'm thinking of and, and all this. And I don't take them captive 
for whatever reason, the easiest path is just to allow it to go. Michelle and I were talking. She has a friend who was talking to her about, about what do you do when you feel stressed, okay? So you, this, I think, applies to a lot of things. So let's, let's just, some of you like, yep, that's my life. I'm pretty stressed out, right? Um, I love this. Listen to this. Here's just a great exercise for you. Take out a piece of paper. Write down what's stressing you out. Next school, I don't, whatever, right? You know, my marriage, my kid, I, whatever. Like, th- th- this is stressing me out. This is causing me some anxiety. Or this is causing me to be depressed, whatever. And then what are the thoughts that sort of surround that? What are the things that are, that are sort of coming into your mind going, hey, here's why. Here's why you should be depressed or anxious or stressed out or whatever. And you start to sort of write those all over the page. Here's the good. So that, that, that could be simply psychological mumbo jumbo at this point. But here's the, here's the Christian part. What if you took all those thoughts and, and looked at them and said, what's the biblical counterpoint to this lie? What's the biblical truth that would allow me to erase that? See, <laughs> that's hard work. That is really, really hard work. Remember what we said at the very beginning? Every discipline's hard work. Every single discipline that God calls you to is hard work, including the discipline of your mind. It's not easy. It's just worth it. See, okay, hear me. Go out with this thought. I am either being conformed to the pattern of this world or I am being transformed. And the only difference between the two is what's coming into my mind. Is is my mind being renewed? That's the only way transformation is going to happen. Every person in here wants to be transformed. I, I, you don't even have to be a Christian to say, I, I, I want to be different. I want to start over. I want to redo. I want, I want a renewal. <laughs> there it is. It comes through the renewal of your mind, which is our are gazing upon God, looking upon Him, being taught and, and exposed to the things of God over and over again. This is, by the way, this is a lifetime. Um, I'm not talking about, hey, go do this for a week. Uh, hey, by the way, if you deleted social media for a week, I promise you'll come here next week feeling better. I can almost guarantee that. I'm saying this is a lifetime of discipline. A lifetime It's not going to end tomorrow, and it's not going to end in a week or two weeks. It might be decades of just, I've I've got to continually be disciplined, be diligent, guard my heart and mind in Christ Jesus, right? And then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, right? That will be there, set as a guard over my heart. Let's pray. Father. Oh, we love you, and we do thank you, God. You, you've made us, we're, we're not base creatures. We don't merely operate by instinct. You have given us minds, and you've called us um, to discipline our minds for the sake of godliness, to relearn wrong things, to learn the right things, to plant and weed play offense and defense and so I pray help us God we need your grace to do that and we recognize that none of this happens apart from the regenerating work of, of the Holy Spirit in our lives and then, and then th- when, the, when, when we believe on the Lord and the veil is lifted the Spirit comes to dwell and gives us the power to do the very things we're talking about Lord we want the mind of Christ and yet If we're being honest, Lord, we confess to you our sin of being conformed to the world in the pattern of our thinking. Help us, God. Lord, I just pray. Pray for my friends here. Pray for myself. God, we're being lied to every single day, nearly every moment, that we would learn to speak to those lies, speak the truth of Scripture to them. 
And I pray, God, I pray for people that maybe are here this morning who, where they hear a message like this, but they don't know Jesus Christ. First and foremost, the veil has not been lifted because they have not believed on the Lord. And I pray today would be a day when you'd lift the veil. I pray that today would be the day where, where Holy Spirit, you would regenerate hearts and bring about belief and cause repentance. Do what only you can do, I pray. We love you. We thank you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.